Okay, I'd like to get started. Welcome, uh, on behalf of the Center for Political Studies here at ISR and the Department of Political Science at the College of LSNA. Uh, I am Ken Coleman, a director of the Center for Political Studies. We have the privilege today to honor and celebrate the life of our colleague, friend, mentor, family member, Ronald F. Englehart. I speak for all of us here present in this room and online in sending our deepest condolences to Marita, Ron, Milo, and all of Ron's extended family. We all miss Ron very much, and we are saddened by his death. This occasion is an opportunity to share our grief, but it's also an opportunity to share our memories, our thoughts, and yes, even our laughter together to celebrate the life of this very famous and prominent scholar who was also a silly, corny, song-filled jokester. <laughs> I will have more personal remarks to say shortly. In these times of COVID, we have a hybrid event today with some people speaking in person and others by video, and also where some are in person and others are online in the audience. And some are even going to watch it as recorded at, at a later time. We will begin with a video in a moment. Then we will have remarks by some of those present and some of those not present in video form. If we have time, we will have an open microphone session for people to make spontaneous comments. Marita will speak last. I wanna make you aware that the family has started an endowment for the Englehart Scholarship to support research in comparative politics for graduate students and young scholars in political science at U of M. We ask for your support of this important effort to continue his legacy. The speakers voluntarily may take off their masks as they're speaking here in accordance with provost rules. But otherwise we ask that everybody remain masked, including the speakers when they go back to their seats. And speakers, please stay behind the podium because there's a camera on you for people online. And finally, for all those present in person, there is a reception following this event. Ron Engelhart was an extraordinary human being, a loving husband to Marita, a doting father, a remarkable mentor and teacher, a global uh, institution builder, a groundbreaking scholar who won renowned and justly honored tributes from around the world. Ron's book, The Silent Revolution, was the very first book in political science that I couldn't wait to read. His influential and famous, as well as best-selling books, have been translated into many world languages and have been used in hundreds of universities in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and learning of thousands of students of all continents. I would argue that Ron had a goal he deemed worthy of his effort throughout his life course, and a part of that goal late in his life was here in Russia. I think that Ron's initial motivation was primarily the generous grant from the Russian government that, among other things, financed the sixth round of the World Value Service in a dozen countries. Soon enough, however, he found that the remainder of that money was spent to create a community of young, talented, and motivated scholars who were eager to work with him. Ron Englehart was an amazing mentor, uh, an amazing researcher, 
an amazing instructor. I've learned so much from him throughout the years. I was really blessed and amazed to be a student of his. I was inspired by all, by all his great work on the World Values Survey. And I always thought that if one day I could just borrow a little bit of that knowledge and that dedication, um, I could do something wonderful. And he always inspired me as I thought about the Arab Barometer and starting the Arab Barometer. Ron, you will be missed. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Your legend lives on. May you rest in peace. Dear Ron, you were a good friend. You have left a great legacy. You will not be forgotten. You live on in our minds and hearts. He was my mentor, dear friend, and truly soulmate. It fills me with a deep sense of gratitude, Bill. And yes, fulfillment of having had the privilege to spend so much meaningful time with such a beautiful mind. Ron, you made your mark intellectually, personally, and institutionally. These were profound marks on our world, and they've moved it in a positive direction in all three phases. Uh, we miss you in the Center for Political Studies and in ISR and then the Political Science Department and all the people you've affected in this world and, 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 and had an impact on uh, who are still around are sad, but we're also delighted to celebrate your life and to acknowledge what a, a, a major impact you've had in a positive way on this world. And so today is a very special day to celebrate your life. I miss Ron Engelhardt. He was not only a world-class scholar, he was also a wonderful, warm, and generous colleague. I think about Ron almost every day. I join you all in mourning the passing of Ron Engelhardt. Ron was an outstanding scholar, as we all know. But beyond that, <coughs> it was tremendous fun. I'll always remember his warm smile and enthusiastic greeting whenever <coughs> I saw him. He lit up a room and he was great with children. When mine were young, they were always excited to see Ron because of the way he would pretend to pick them up by the ears and then roar with laughter. Joan and I send our condolences to Marita and the whole Engelhart family. Rest in peace, Ron. Hello everyone, I'm Ann Curzan, Dean of the College of Literature, Science and the Arts here at the University of Michigan. And it's an honor to be here virtually with you to remember Professor Ronald Engelhart, Amy and Alan Lowenstein, Professor Emeritus of Democracy, Democratization and Human Rights in the Department of Political Science and Research Professor Emeritus at the Center for Political Studies at the Institute for Social Research here at the University of Michigan, an institution that he devoted his career to. Professor Engelhart joined our faculty in 1967 and retired from the university in 2018, a remarkable 51 years. And he remained an active member of our community until he passed away this year. As I've read memorials for Professor Engelhart, the word that comes to mind is giant. And I don't use that term lightly. Professor Engelhart was an intellectual giant in his field. And when we think about the fact that each of us as a scholar stands on the shoulders of the scholars who preceded us, it brings home the remarkable legacy of a scholarly giant like Professor Engelhart, who boosts everyone who follows in the field that much higher. He marked his career early with the book, The Silent Revolution, which is considered foundational with concepts like post-materialist values or later values of self-expression that are now standard in the social sciences. 
And I will say as a scholar that many of us can only dream about creating concepts that become standard. By 2018, he was named the most cited political scientist in the world, a giant among giants. And we are deeply honored that he chose to spend his career here. I think about the legacy of the World Value Society, which Professor Engelhart founded and directed, which has produced data used by thousands of researchers since the early 1990s, or the Eurobarometer surveys, or the Laboratory for Comparative Social Research at the Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg, Russia, recently renamed, and I'm delighted by this, the Ronald F. Engelhart Laboratory for Comparative Social Research. And then there is the legacy that lives on in every student he taught and mentored, and every colleague who worked alongside him, whose scholarship and professional lives were shaped by this remarkable leader in the field. Professor Engelhart was a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Science, among many, many honors. And he was also a deeply valued teacher and mentor and citizen of the department, the college, and the university. As the Dean of LSA, I want to say how fortunate we feel to have benefited from Professor Engelhart's presence and innumerable contributions as a scholar, teacher, mentor, and colleague. It is an overwhelming understatement to say that he will be missed. And I'm honored to have had the opportunity to remember his legacy with all of you today. Hello, I'm Nancy Burns, Chair of the Department of Political Science and a colleague of Ron's for the last 30 years. I'm sad and honored um, to be able to talk about Ron today. When I spoke about him in front of him last, I said what I said there. I said that his ideas were the very first that excited me in political science. His book, The Silent Revolution, was the very first book in political science that I couldn't wait to read. And I'm really glad I got to say that to him directly. I want to talk some about Ron's teaching and mentorship, mostly just to say things that you already know about him. He taught in the department through last year. And so uh, in my way, I went back and read all of the teaching evaluations for all of his courses, going back as far as we have them online. The thing that stands out across time, across courses, is that the students say he inspired them to learn and to want to know more about the topics that he introduced them to. They talked about how approachable he was, how brilliant he was, how he made their class a deeply democratic experience. But most of all, they talk about how he inspired them. I heard from many graduate students when they heard the news, some who taught with him in the early 1970s, some who were in wholly different fields, but who saw the magnetic force around him. I heard from graduate students from every decade of his time here. They told stories of him in the late 60s, carrying his punch card data in the basket of his bicycle to the computer center to get it processed. I guess that one day he uh, hit a bump. No. And my cards went wrong. Um, what was remarkable to me was no matter the decade, no matter the student's particular connection with Ron, the stories these students told were nearly identical. And they told their stories with nearly identical words. They said over and over again that he was a good and kind soul. And I especially liked the way his student Carolina Segovia described it. She said, I can tell you what I said to my daughters when I heard the news. Ron Englehart was a brilliant person and he can deservedly be named as one of the most important and prolific political scientists in the last 50 years. He was my advisor at graduate school from the first day I arrived in Ann Arbor until I finished my dissertation. I was also his TA in comparative politics and did some work as a research assistant. What I remember and cherish the most, however, 
was his kindness, generosity, and humbleness. He was always willing to listen to people, paying attention and answering as if every question was the most important one. He always treated everyone with respect. He was generous with his knowledge and his work at WBS proves that, but also with his time. He would always invite TAs, partners included, for dinner at his place at the end of the semester. And we had some very interesting and funny talks at his house with his family. In a period when academics can be harsh, competitive, and with too many believing themselves to be geniuses and above others, Ron set a different example. He was a great teacher and political scientist, but he was also a great mentor. And we were really lucky in our time with him. Thank you. At Ron's retirement event, someone said, like when we say words like bazillion or Googleplex to signal an unattainable number, he's published an Inglehart amount of work. <laughs> it seems easy to say it. One of the most, if not the most widely cited researchers in his profession, but excellence and hard work to achieve it are worth pondering and marveling over the global spread of his ideas, the reach, the young scholars who today still read his earliest work, his 400 papers and his 15 books, 14 books. His mark on knowledge is profound, lasting, ongoing, and immensely important and helpful to people on every continent of this earth. Ron, through his teaching and research, was in the business of making a complicated world intelligible of making what is fuzzy, clear, understandable, describable. He left an imprint on his profession and as deep and as enduring as anyone who has ever studied government and politics. He's one of those transformative figures in an academic discipline for which an entire lexicon and way of thinking about the world were formed because of his research and writings. He created a part of the air we breathe in political science. Post-materialism is a term so widely used and analyzed that younger people would imagine that it's been around forever. No, it took Ron to define it, study it, develop it, promulgate it. His study of modernization, of changes happening in societies, culture and values change, of societies transforming, or of the promise of development and the failures of governments, the dangers of despots, of populism, They've all shaped our thinking. <clears throat> a formative moment for Ron was being in Paris in 1968 to study the massive uprising. He conducted a nationally representative survey to find out what the French public thought of the uprising and people's own participation. Expecting to find that this was a working class movement of people who had shifted left. In fact, the working class had shifted right in support of the Gaullist government. This finding encouraged him to probe further and to develop the ideas that would become the basis of the concept of post-materialism. He followed the French study with a six nation survey in Europe and discovered much the same thing. The working class was still worried about salaries and their material well-being, while the growing middle class in Western Europe focused their political attention on securing personal autonomy and freedom of expression. Over decades of research, he generalized these findings to many other countries, both developing and developed, to see it as a global phenomenon. Growing affluence changed the values of people to orient their political attitudes towards post-materialism. One thing I admire about Ron was that he took criticism well and relished it. I recall in graduate school, my first reading of an Engelhart article, a professor of mine had us read a famous one and then bashed it, claiming without evidence or much of a logical argument that Ron's ideas, while ostensibly about modernization and development, were actually more about colonial domination of the developing world 
and that Ron was indirectly supporting exploitation because he heralded economic development over other <coughs> values. This commentary puzzled me at the time, and it still does. In conversations with Ron later, after I became a colleague, when these kinds of critiques went with, from Ron or about Ron would come up, he would respond with something, not with a face or an expression, <coughs> but rather a look at data. And he would suggest a measure of sympathy, if warranted, for the arguments. Most importantly, the development was not a value in itself, but rather only if it led to, among other things, the expansion of lifespans, the education of women, and the survival of babies and mothers at childbirth. He took all the criticism as a reason to sharpen and hone his arguments. He was in many ways the consummate scholar putting value on an act intellectual integrity and the continued ongoing search for knowledge, knowledge always. Ron touched people in person within this profession as few others have. He was a colleague, a friend, a person down the hall, a man who had a corny sense of humor and a funny sarcasm that could only come from his rich understanding of how other people view the world. He was beloved by his fellow professors at Michigan and by the many people whom he collaborated with around the world. He collaborated with people on every continent, revered by people studying cultural change and using surveys to understand public opinion. Twitter and Facebook lit up with tributes to Ron hours after the news of his death. Op-eds were published in foreign capitals about him by his collaborators. We in CPS are sad about losing Ron and we will miss him dearly. I already miss him very much. I wanna say, however, that I am utterly grateful for the privilege of being one of his colleagues and I appreciate this time today celebrating and remembering him, his contributions, his kindness, his presence, and yes, his corny jokes. Ron, you changed the world. Really, you did, you did change the world. We owe you a tribute and I say thank you. Oh. Hi, I am uh, John Miller. Um, I am a colleague of uh, Ron's. And I think I may have known him longer than anybody else in this room. Um, in, the, in the fall of 1964, Ron and I were second year graduate students at the University of Chicago. And we were selected as NORC fellows. Um, and so we spent the next nine months in what we would call survey research boot camp. <laughs> um, Jim Davis, a distinguished sociologist who created the Journal of Social Survey later, um, had spent the next nine months helping a small group of about 12 of us, I guess, uh, who had been selected to learn all the things we ought to know about survey research. Uh, and it was a uh, remarkable experience because Jim didn't like to teach during the day, but we would start at 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon and go until 7. And about once a month, his wife would then provide uh, wine and, and uh, nibblies, and uh, it was a very interesting seminar. Uh, but we learned a lot because uh, NORC had a great number of, of distinguished survey researchers, many of whom are no longer with us, but I mentioned them names only to tell you the kind of background that Ron had in, in survey research. Uh, Jim Davis, of course, was the director, but Norman Bradburn uh, spent um, several sessions teaching us how to write a question. Uh, Seymour Sudman spent time telling us how to draw samples. Um, Peter Rossi uh, spent some time telling us how to study urban, uh, urban issues. And uh, they brought in Herb Costner to tell us about uh, proportional reduction of error measures. And so it was an extraordinary experience. And I think that since he and I started on the same ground, we've always worked together over the last 57 years. Um, but I think one of the things that, that came out of that common experience was he had a, a real understanding of what it meant to do a quality survey. And he also understood how to do a quality survey. And as a result, uh, his work, both 
uh, in this country and through the Arab barometer, I think was, was well informed. Um, so after we spent our year together in, uh, in boot camp, um, uh, my mentor was going off to Uganda to um, <clears throat> on a Fulbright. So I took a detour and went to Washington and, and worked uh, in the White House for a couple of years. Ron obviously stayed and finished because he arrived here in 67 <laughs> when I was just returning to graduate school. So uh, we, we didn't quite stay in touch for a long time. But then it turned out, and I want to mention this other person who had, had a great influence on Ron and a great influence on me also, but but particularly on Ron, was the director of the Eurobarometer, Jacques-René Rabier. <clears throat> and he um, was very interested in Ron's work on post-materialist values. And, and, and Jacques-René was a really European scholar writ large. He, uh, and so he would spend a lot of time with Ron. He also turned out to have a great interest in science and scientific literacy and health. So he was working with me and to write questions on the Eurobarometer on science. Um, so we would um, both working with him, but never in the same room at the same time. Um, but if, if those of you who may know anything about Brussels, the big headquarters is called Berlin Mall. It's a super large building. And down the street, there's a small hotel called the Euroflot. And I was going about that in those, at once I was out of graduate school and was an assistant professor and Ron was here as an assistant professor. And we were both working with Jacques René. And I was going about four times a year to Brussels, and I think Ron must have gone a lot more than that. <laughs> um, and as I was walking through the lobby of the Euroflot about twice a year or so, I'd hear Ron's voice saying, John, John. And he and I would then arrange to have a, um, a drink or something else and, and get to catch up on each other. And we did that for about four or five years while he was finishing his book and doing other things. Uh, and then my work changed and his work changed, and so we... we uh, again, uh, we're separated for four or five years. And then we begin to talk at APSA every year. Um, and um, then I, think, I was just trying to think about the timing. I think probably about 13 years ago, uh, Ron and I were having dinner one night in Washington during an APSA meeting. And he said, you ought to come to ISR. <laughs> so we began a discussion. And about 10 months later, uh, I got an appointment and we, I came here. And for the last 11 years, I've worked really intensively with Ron on the World Value Survey and on other projects. Um, and he is, as all of you have said, a great scholar, a great colleague, and, and when you're working with him, a great co-author. And the great thing was we really started with Jim Davis and we really understood the same things about survey research. So it made it so easy to work together in that sense. And I think that I was just looking at a file I got a few days ago from the European uh, or from the World Value Survey. <clears throat> One of Ron's really lasting contributions has been when he and I both started to read about political socialization. We were reading the work of Kent Jennings and, and Richard Nemi and other people who put a lot of emphasis on parents and children and siblings and cousins and neighbors and other people. Uh, Ron looked at society he didn't look at your significant others. He looked at the, the, the society you lived in, the political system you lived in. And that's what whose materials values was about. And what he did was he materially changed the nature of political socialization research to include not just your mother and father or your cousin or your teacher, um, but all the people in your society and the character of your society because societies differ a lot uh, by their character. Uh, anyway, I think that, that, as everyone knows, his, his contribution to political science and to political socialization and to political learning has been profound. And it will be with us for decades and, and perhaps centuries into the future. Um, and it has been a really great pleasure for me to have known him for all these years and for our careers in various ways. Uh, and I, I, like all of you, will miss him greatly. And I'm very happy to see his family here. And um, I know he loved his family a great deal. And, and um, I'm sure you are uh, having a lot of, uh, of difficulty with all this also as we are. But um, he was a first rate scholar. And having seen him over the last 50 years, so forth, um, it, it is uh, my honor to be able to share that with you because I don't know that everybody 
realizes <laughs> what a great root, uh, what a great uh, baseline training he had in survey research and how he used that over the years. But he was actually a, a, not just a theoretician, but he was in terms of the mechanics of how you actually measure things. He was very, very good. So it was my pleasure to know Duran and to share this with you. And I thank you very much. Bye bye. Um, I'm Arlene Saxonhouse. Uh, uh, for, first, let me thank Marita and, and Ken for asking me to speak at this service. I feel honored to be able to do so and appreciate the opportunity to express publicly some brief thoughts about Ron. My colleague in the Department of Political Science for over 50 years, it's difficult to think of the department without Ron as a member. I think of Ron as a lion, I guess the word giant was used before, but I think of him as a lion within the discipline of political science. And others have spoken already about, uh, spoken or will have spoken about the huge influence his research and publications have had on the discipline and how we study changing democratic values around the world. And while I certainly think of him as a lion in this respect, I also think of him as a lion without a roar. When I conjure up an image of Ron, apart from the black fur hat that he wore in winters, I assume acquired in Russia on one of his many trips there, um, apart from that hat, it is his gentle demeanor that dominates my memories of him. To use a word that is perhaps not in so much favor these days, let me say that it is his, was his gentleman, gentlemanly demeanor. We would often pass each other uh, right after he had given his lecture for the introductory course in comparative politics, just as I was coming into the office. And along with his twinkling eyes and slightly askew smile, there would be just the slightest hint of a bow as we would greet each other. A bit old fashioned, but perhaps also, but also very much appreciated. Perhaps it was Ron's time as a graduate student at the University of Chicago, or perhaps it was just who he was. But even though he and I were in very different subfields in the discipline that is political science, the pleasure that he expressed during our lunches that we shared, reflecting on his engagement with the texts of political theory and the teachers he had encountered during his graduate student years, revealed a depth of theoretical engagement that continued to inform his own work on democracy and always delighted me. Ron was broad in his interests wide and wide ranging in his intellectual engagements. He was willing to think deeply about the theoretical implications of the highly empirical research in which he was involved. But the memory of Ron that is perhaps the most meaningful to me goes way, way back to my first year at the University of Michigan in 1972. My husband, Gary, was new in the economics department and was also connected with the Japan Center. And as was the custom at that time, the dinner <coughs> invitations for those units abounded. But most of my male colleagues were not quite so sure how to interact with a new female colleague. And as a result, largely avoided such interactions. Not Ron. He invited Gary and me to dinner at his home. I have no recollection what we ate or even what we talked about, but I remember the wonderful feeling that Ron had accepted me. I was a colleague whom he would treat as he treated other colleagues or as Gary's colleagues treated him. I was not an anomaly. It was for me a critical moment in feeling part of the department and Ron was the one who made that happen. The vividness with which that evening remains in my mind after almost 50 years suggests how important it was to me. Ron probably didn't remember that evening and I regret that I never mentioned to him how much it meant to me. But it was a gesture of generosity and welcoming that I will always associate with the gentle lion that was Ron. I miss him as do we all.
Phoenix. Sadly, Rosemary and I were unable to attend um, Ron's uh, funeral in Ann Arbor last May. So I am especially honored and grateful to Marita for inviting me to deliver these remarks at, the, at this memorial service. <clears throat> in fact, um, as Rosemary and I were uh, observing the funeral services virtually through the funeral website, um, a remarkable misunderstanding occurred that I think Ron himself would have enjoyed. At the appointed hour, uh, I pressed the appropriate button and we were taken immediately to the, um, to the uh, services. Um, I looked around to see if I knew anybody, but uh, that was not possible because the camera was behind them and um, therefore I couldn't see their faces. The camera was focused instead on the altar. Well, that was a little surprising because it was clearly a church and and the hymns and the and the uh, liturgy seemed to go on forever. Uh, I had not thought that Ron was deeply religious, but I did know that he had studied religion intensively in recent decades, and therefore I concluded that he must have had a remarkable, life-changing religious conversion late in life. <laughs> a number of the eulogies, uh, the eulogists uh, praised Ron or Ronnie for his entre entrepreneurial skills, and that fit the Ron I knew. Um, though I was a little surprised when another speaker praised the many big businesses that Ronnie had created. <laughs> it's just unfamiliar. Eventually, <laughs> however, as the tributes to Ronnie's religiosity and to his business acumen began to accumulate, folks <laughs> began to gnaw at me. I, I genuinely perplexed, I turned to Rosemary and said, could this possibly be the Ron Engelhardt that you and I have known for more than half a century? <laughs> I know all of you have guessed, all of you have guessed what happened. I backed out of the main to the main web, the main funeral website, and um, <clears throat> then realized that the previous 40 minutes we had been watching the funeral service of Ronald Cresswell, aged 86, <laughs> and our in Key Largo. <laughs> I'm glad to be speaking finally to the, uh, about the right Ron in the right venue. Ron Engelhart was an extraordinary human being, uh, a loving husband to Marita, a doting father, a remarkable mentor and teacher, uh, a, a global uh, institution builder, a groundbreaking scholar who won renowned and justly honored um, tributes from around the world. Others will talk about all those things. My wife, Rosemary, tells me that in situations like this, I should do light. And I usually tell her, I don't do light, I do lugubrious. But in this case, I want to do light because I want to speak about Ron Engelhardt my longtime dear personal friend. That is, I want to recall Ron Engelhardt as the young, untenured lecturer, intellectually ambitious, but still unknown, utterly unknown, just like me. Ron himself was fond of joking later how improbable it was that he and I ended up as the two most cited political scientists in the world given the um, humble uh, joint beginnings that we had. <coughs> the first class I ever taught, I taught jointly with Ron uh, in the large lecture room uh, in Lane Hall in the fall of 1968, as clouds of tear gas drifted incessantly across the dying. Ron and I couldn't get out more than a word or two without being shouted down by uh, protesters in the in the class um, as lackeys of capitalist imperialism. Uh, 
since Rod and I were barely older than them and, and equally matched their hair, their facial hair, um, it seemed to be a little um, uh, ambitious, a little creative for them to think of us as uh, global tyrants. But what I remember most vividly from those days is the small, passionate group of young scholars centered around ISR in the late 1960s and early 1970s, most of whom themselves turned out to be major world-class scholars. We shared ideas about fundamental issues. We challenged one another. We, um, we regularly, and we learned from one another, and we regularly lunched together in what Jack Walker labeled <clears throat> pardon me, the Half-Baked Ideas Seminar. <laughs> Although all of us went on to, particip to participate in many other warm intellectual communities in our lives, I think it's probably fair to say that none of us ever took part in a more lively, more ambitious, and more rewarding intellectual community than the Half-Baked Ideas Seminar. <laughs> And Ron was at the center of that conversation, <clears throat> always listening carefully to our ideas and always challenging us with his breathtaking originality. Ron was a remarkable participant in intellectual debates of any sort, um, always firmly convinced that he was right and yet equally firm in listening to his critics and indeed welcoming criticism. That Half-Baked Ideas Seminar was a crucible out of which emerged the Solid Revolution and the Eurobarometer Surveys and much later, Evolution of Culture, Cultural Evolution, the, the capstone of his, of his uh, career. Uh, after decades of fruitful collaboration with many other creative scholars and decades of hard work and still unquenchable creativity. I want to give you one brief final glimpse of that crucible. In this photo, with Ron in the center and me at the right, as well as Joel Auerbach, Arnie Cantor, later to become US Secretary of State, and a half dozen others who sit just beyond the left edge of this photo. Note our hair, of course, but also more subtly, the jackets that most of us are wearing, living in the 70s, but raised in the 50s. I began these remarks with a, a story about Ron and religion. I want to conclude them with another story about religion. Yom Kippur is the most sacred day in the Jewish calendar. At its core is a very striking visual, metaphorical image of two books within which God inscribes all of our names. On the one hand, the book of life, in which he inscribes the names of those of us who have lived sufficiently meritorious lives that were destined for heaven. And in the other, on the other hand, in the other book, he inscribes the names of those who are doomed to eternal damnation. But elsewhere in that liturgy, we, we hear of a third book that's in which are inscribed the names of a select few. That volume is called The Book of Lives Well Lived. That is undoubtedly the book in which Ronald F. Engelhardt's name is inscribed. The Book of Lives Well Lived. Thank you. Hello. I am Christian Welzel from Lofana University in Lüneburg, Germany. 
Ronald Engelhardt was my most frequent and what is more important, most impactive co-author. He was my mentor, dear friend, and truly soulmate. Realizing that Ronald Engelhard is no longer with us is devastatingly saddening, for sure. It is as great a loss <coughs> as human imagination can grasp. It fills me with a deep sense of gratitude, though, and yes, fulfillment of having had the privilege to spend so much meaningful time with such a beautiful mind. Ron and I are a generation, in fact, exactly 30 years apart, and yet this relationship developed into something very deep and meaningful. I met Ron for the first time in person in summer 1998 at the occasion of a World Value Survey Summit on the countryside of Sangersorby, close to Stockholm in Sweden. It didn't take an afternoon until we found ourselves sitting on a bench overlooking the lake and philosophizing about human values, cultural change, and the pulse of civilization. This was the beginning of a long-lasting intellectual companionship and growing personal friendship. <coughs> I experienced Ron as a theory developer, evidence presenter, data collector, institution builder, passionate teacher, and committed supervisor of unmatched dimensions. More importantly for me, though, he was an honest mentor and genuine friend of the gentlest kind. Intellectual curiosity and enthusiasm, combined with a profound sense of responsibility and, last but not least, an empathetic loving personality is what I rem is what <coughs> I remember when thinking of you, Ronald. Ronald, you will always have a privileged place in my heart and my soul. I wish you to rest in peace. My sincere condolences go to Marita, Ronald Charles, and Milo. May happiness be with all of you. I'm Jenna Bednar. I'm a member of the faculty here in political science and also in public policy. And uh, I want to start by saying hello to his family and to his broader family, because that's basically what we all were, all of us who are touched by Ron. And I want to start by sharing uh, a perspective, not as a colleague, but as his undergraduate because I took my first political science course from Ron. Uh, I was an undergrad here, um, and I still remember it very well. Uh, it was poli sci 140. Uh, many in this room have taught it. Uh, and taught. It. so Ron had this way. It was a Tuesday, Thursday lecture, biggish lecture. Uh, on Tuesdays, we'd learn about uh, a country's institutions, say the semi-presidential uh, system of France, and then on Thursday, uh, we'd learn about France's policies, its welfare system or its foreign policy or whatever. And then the next week, we'd move on 
to another country, starting with its institutions on Tuesday and then on to policies and behaviors on Thursday. Each week, we connected institutions to policies and behavior, and over the course of the semester, we developed a comparative view. I loved it. I know you guys don't teach it this way anymore. <laughs> I loved it. It cracked open my world. I was from a very middle class, suburban family outside of Chicago. I had hardly traveled, definitely never outside of the country. And I was only dimly aware that there are very different ways of structuring a democracy. Um, and that the way a democracy is structured would affect the choices that its government makes. It hadn't even occurred to me. And I'm sure that that's why I became a scholar of institutions. Brown also taught the last political science course that I took here as an undergrad, uh, a senior seminar called Democratization. Um, and so it, we, we read, this was this must have been in uh, the end of 89 or early 1990. And uh, um, we read big chunks of his not quite yet published book, Culture Shift. <laughs> and as the semester rolled forward, the 12 of us who are around the table realized, oh my gosh. <laughs> We're like with the scholar of democratization, we were starstruck. He, the way that he was able to bring science to something that we had some kind of intuitive sense about, that, that the world was changing, that the people were changing, that the way they viewed their place in the world, their relations to one another, um, what they felt was right and just, that that was changing this thing that felt kind of immeasurable he was measuring, the ephemeral he was capturing, and it felt so powerful. <clears throat> he was also the first professor that I had as an undergraduate. Uh, I should point out, I never took a course from Arlene or from Don. Uh, so he was the first professor I had, um, uh, and I think the only one as an undergrad who ever mentioned his family. And so here's how it happened. I was in his uh, CPS office and um, during office hours and I was asking him about something or other that I was writing. And I remember looking um, at this old map he had on the wall behind his desk. Um, and, and I said, um, is that Paris? That's, it's very disorienting the way uh, that it's framed. And, because it's rotated 90 degrees. It had the sun running up and down. Um, so by this point, thanks to Ron, I, 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 just inspiring me, I traveled and I'd actually spend a summer on foot in Paris and I knew it really, the city really well. Um, but Ron acted as if I just said something really brilliant and insightful. He was so encouraging that way. He could make you feel smart just to get you to try and explore your ideas a little bit further. And, and then, uh, as we're talking about that, then suddenly he put his hands on the, on the desk just like this and stood up and he said, well, I gotta go. Uh, I have to pick up my daughter from soccer. And I was like, he has a daughter. A professor of mine has a family. I mean, of course they do. Right? It's just that no one had ever mentioned it. And yet for Ron, this was completely ordinary. Of course, I have to, I have to, you know, yeah, go off and do this, this, this um, next part of my day. And only when returning here as faculty did I realize how completely um, that was just, that was Ron, right? That he wasn't the kind of person who would compartmentalize his life. He was always completely, fully himself. Uh, so when Scotty and I moved to Ann Arbor, my husband, um, and we had our son, Ori, almost immediately. I arrived seven months pregnant. Um, Ron and Marita became like family to us. They were the first ones to have us over. And um, there was a, it was a beautiful day, a Sunday brunch. Um, 
and I uh, had planted some rose bushes and uh, some of them had come into bloom. So the very first cuttings from my garden, I cut to bring over Marita and Ron asked, acted as if I would given them some treasure uh, and just welcomed us in and treated us like family and asked us to be nothing more or less than ourselves. At that time, Scotty and I were developing a model of the interaction between culture and institutions. And our approach couldn't be more different than Ron's. Uh, we, we were developing an agent-based model and also a mathematical or game theoretic model of it. Um, but Ron could see that our aim was in, in a lot of senses identical to his. And he was so encouraging of what we were doing, being enthusiastic about it. And I remember sharing with him some frustrating, very frustrating uh, reviews. And Ron said, that's all right, you're just ahead of your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he suggested that he and I co-teach a graduate seminar on culture. And I wish we still were able to do this because that's the only time I've ever co-taught, of course. Um, and because I learned as much, and I learned more than any of the other students there. I learned so much and it really shaped the work that Scotty and I did so much for the better uh, because of these, these dialogues we would have and then with the students, it was an, it was an amazing semester for me. So his energy, his positivity was such a constant. I remember, I, I miss so much. I miss you all walking by. They live not too far from us and go for these evening walks and you still are going for the evening walks. I, rem I just miss Ron going, hello. <laughs> Doesn't stop, right? Just the hello and that's what we needed. It was uh, hearing that. Ron is literally why I became a political scientist. And for as different as my work might seem from his, it's so deeply shaped by it. And I was always grateful to him for seeing that. So what a gift he's given us to do your science the way that you believe is best and be the best you can at it. Do it with your whole <coughs> self, bringing your love to it, do it with joy. And have the humility to be grateful for those who do the same, no matter how differently they do it from you. Miss him. My name is Alejandro Moreno. I would like to thank the Center for Political Studies, Marita, and all the Ingle, her family, for this memorial. For me, Professor Ingle has set great examples of scientific curiosity, of prolific and insightful publications, of cheerful collegial relations, and very importantly, of how to enjoy what you do during your entire life sometimes with great pleasures and sometimes with frustrations, but always with a positive mood. He set an example of a kind, generous, inspiring, and loving human being. I was his student. I was very lucky that he came to Mexico, Mexico City, where I lived and studied in 1990. And that changed my life. I became his research assistant, collaborator, eventually a colleague, and as I'd like to think, perhaps a friend. Although a few times I heard him say the, the, the term intellectual son, which perhaps I think may apply to those who he trained, who followed his theory, and who constantly, without ending, 
benefited from his advice and guidance, both professionally and personally. He set a great example of an intellectual father in that sense. Our anecdotes reflect how he lives now in our memories, and I'd like to share a brief one with you. And rather than an anecdote, some, of, some words I heard him too. Professor Inglehart constantly relied on data to develop his theory. We know and heard about the role of Eurobarometer surveys in his early work, and the European and World Value surveys later on, to which he devoted lots of time and energy. He was very proud about the Joint Values Project, and we probably all heard him say how it was conducted in about 100 countries, covering more than 90% of the world's population. I heard him once say, and I quote, of course, my dream would be to cover every country and to do it every year. We are not studying all humanity all the time, but we are getting close. I finished the quote. <coughs> he described the WBS as, I quote again, absolutely fascinating. It's the kind of the dream instrument that if I had had a magic wand, I would have created something like this, he said. And I repeat, a magic wand. Well, we all know it was an instant, but he made it possible, among many other things. It took decades. It built on a global network of scholars, and it has become one of the most widely used resources in the social sciences, supported by different organizations and individuals. The WBS was fueled with the ideas that Ron tested tirelessly, the ideas that made him one of the top cited political scientists. As one of his collaborators, I can attest that Ron's research efforts developed a strong sense of teamwork, of community, and loyalty. When Ron received the Wayport Award in 2014 uh, for his contributions to survey research, one of the many awards, uh, prestigious awards that he got for his work, he referred to the EBS WBS as, I quote, a major achievement. But it is our achievement, he said. I helped launch it, but it is all of us who are getting on. I'll finish the quote. That spirit of collaboration was part of the magic. And I hope it keeps going and that Ron's legacy endures. Like I said, a little over 30 years ago, he came to Mexico City in one of his many conferences, and that changed my life. My deepest gratitude to him. Thank you for everything, Professor Inglehart. Today, friends and collaborators <coughs> from across the globe remember Ronald Inglehart. I would have loved to come to the ISR myself. The pandemic has been in its way. This video is a poor substitute for personal encounters. I hope it will <coughs> properly convey my two major thoughts. I'm an old pillar of Ron's European network. Ours was also his home in Cologne, Mannheim, and Berlin. My wife Ute and I first met Ron in 1970, when I was attending the summer course of the Inter-University Consortium for Political Research. This was shortly before the APSR published his seminal article on the silent revolution in Europe. At this first encounter, Ron displayed all the characteristics we came to like so much over the years, as there are his soft voice, his genuine curiosity, 
his great kindness and his generous hospitality. And of course, there was this passionate pursuit to develop a theory of value change. I had the privilege to work with Ron for almost half a century. Ron was a gifted writer and a great <coughs> organizer. I can't do justice to his oeuvre in the time frame of this short video clip. Thus, let me shortly touch upon what I consider his two major academic achievements, his contribution to modernization theory and his creation of a global repository for survey data. Ronald Engelhardt has contributed to modernization theory in the tradition of Max Weber and Tolkien Parsons. He displayed his theory in seven major volumes and a great number of articles and book chapters. In his last volume, Cultural Evolution, Ron summarized his propositions again and finally called his variant of modernization theory evolutionary modernization theory. He emphasized path dependency and illustrated the impact of cultural values on the transition from traditional to modern society by a cultural map. This cultural map locates most countries of the world and the map proved to be a stroke of genius. The general argument was easy to grasp and his map quickly became not just part of the academic discussion but of the general public discourse as well. The good fairy had endowed Ron with the gift of expressing complex matters in a language that could be understood easily. This was also appreciated by his students. In winter 1997, I taught Ron's course Political Science 441, Politics of Advanced Industrial Societies highlighting recent developments in Central and Eastern Europe. The lack of my students' geographical and historical knowledge was overwhelming, so I tried to chip in <coughs> some detail. <coughs> One day, stepping down the stairs from our classroom, a student came to me saying, Professor, why so many details? We have, many pro we have problems following your lectures do it such as Professor Engelhardt. He is like Karl Marx. He has a great theory, simple to understand and to memorize. Ron believed in an empirical analytical approach to test his evolutionary modernization theory on a global scale. He needed a survey database that was simply not available at the time. Building on Jan Kerkhoff's and Ruth de Moore's European value study, Ron systematically broadened its geographical <coughs> scope. After the regime transitions in Central and Eastern Europe, we joined forces to find interested groups of local scholars to participate in the World Values Project. Today, the World Values Survey covers more than 100 countries in many time periods. Ron's motivation to create this unique database was mainly driven by his desire to put his grand theory to an empirical test. In addition, however, and quite unintendedly, the World Value Survey was used for many other purposes and proved to be a goldmine for comparative survey research. Let me conclude with two short remarks. First. Ron left a political warning when contemplating futures of, modern, of modernity. He emphasized that developed societies could become dystopias controlled by a small minority. As a Democrat, he firmly believed that these inherent winner-take-all constellations could only be offset by political coalitions reflecting the interests of the majority. Fortunately, he also thought 
that this would finally happen. Because, as he said, when survival is at stake, humans usually rise to the occasion. And second, Ron rightfully always paid tribute to you, Marita. Without your support, Ron's achievements would have been simply out of reach. I'm at a loss to explain where you, an active social psychologist of high reputation yourself, have found the time and energy to live up to the task. It must have been love. Here on, you were a good friend. You have left a great legacy. You will not be forgotten. You live on in our minds and hearts. Hello. I am Edward Panarin, a professor of sociology at the Higher School of Economics in Russia. When remembering Ronald Inglehart, I will naturally focus on his experience here in Russia. When, back in 2009, Ron was considering the offer to join Higher School of Economics, he knew that he had developed a serious disease. He also knew that living in Russia would involve hardship meaning definitely less comfort than at home, and the need to cope with harsh climate where one could easily sleep on an icy sidewalk, which actually happened to him in 2009. One has to learn to shuffle rather than walk here during winter time. Thus, his decision to accept the offer might seem unwise. However, he actually lived longer than expected. In spite of what would seem like harsh conditions to anyone who is used to the comfort of affluent societies, I dare say his life in Russia was happy and productive. In order to elucidate this point, I would like to recall an example from Frederick Masteller's Manual on Statistics, where he refers to a study of famous people who one would think could die either before or after their birthday with an equal probability. In fact, however, they were more likely to die shortly after rather than before their birthday. When people have something to look forward to, they are truly capable of wonder work, including postponing their own death. I would argue that Ron had a goal he deemed worthy of his effort throughout his life course, and a part of that goal, late in his life, was here in Russia. I think that Ron's initial motivation was primarily the generous grant from the Russian government that, among other things, financed the sixth round of the World Value Service in a dozen countries. Soon enough, however, he found that the remainder of that money was spent to create a community of young, talented, and motivated scholars who were eager to work with him. So the lab success was something that kept him coming over and over to Russia. As a result, we now have a generation of Russian scholars steeped in his doctrine who are now working not only in Russia. My former junior colleagues have finished doctoral programs in such places as the Columbia University, Princeton University, and of course, the University of Michigan. They are working in North America, Europe, and the Middle East. We still have a vibrant center here in Russia that is bearing his name. As I am stepping down as the lab director, a former student who started working under Ron's guidance in 2010 is taking over. And as far as I can tell, the center has a brilliant future ahead. This is what I think was the effort that Ron considered worthy late in his life. Thank you. I think about Ron almost every day. 
I miss him very much. I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to share my feelings and to just mention a few of the times that our lives intersected uh, and the influence he's had on me. And even though I'll probably mention things that are mostly of a professional nature, it's the personal connection that, uh, that I value the most and that I respect the most. As it turns out, uh, I'm only a few years younger than Ron, and I did my doctoral research on virtually the same subject, probably responding to some of the same world events that, uh, that he did, uh, and not knowing that, uh, that he was uh, blazing a trail that I would, in fact, unknowingly perhaps be following. I did my dissertation research on cultural change in a country that was in the midst of such a revolution, the country of Tunisia that people don't know very much about perhaps, but uh, was a wonderful laboratory for looking at cultural change in all kinds of the same areas that, uh, that Ram was investigating. Uh, the status of women, for example, or the place of religion in public life, for example. Uh, and so uh, later on, as I began to read his work, uh, publishing it certainly before I did, uh, I knew right away that uh, not only would this validate uh, uh, the, the kind of thing that I had committed myself to, uh, but that it gave me many tools for expanding my work, extending my work, and perhaps uh, most important, understanding in the context of modernization theory, uh, some of the significance and the implication of the work I was doing. Uh, Later on, when I came to Michigan, I've been here about 20 years, so it's a long time, but uh, certainly not as long as some of the people that have known Ron and, and, and loved him. Uh, he got me involved in the World Values Survey, uh, gave me a small amount of money to go to Algeria with one of our doctoral students uh, and to do uh, one of the early World Value Surveys in, uh, in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in an, in an Arab country. Uh, it was enough to do a national survey of substantial proportions, uh, even though now uh, that wouldn't get us very much. But uh, back in the uh, early 2000s when I came, uh, enabled us to do a very important survey to really, I think, uh, lay a foundation for uh, the extension of the, of, the, uh, of the World Value Survey uh, to other Arab countries. A few years later, I worked with him and others on doing a, a survey in Iraq. Uh, shortly after the American invasion, uh, we carried out the World Values Survey in Iraq with, of course, the help of, uh, of, of uh, local, uh, uh, local academics. Uh, later on, inspired partly by what Ron had done and the World Values Survey, uh, we began uh, the Air Barometer. Amani Jamal, who uh, made uh, one of the video presentations earlier, and I developed this. And then the model was the uh, the model was the uh, the World Value Survey to do a survey frequently in a number of countries. We couldn't cover a hundred countries, but we've worked in fifteen Arab countries. Uh, and uh, and and I was inspired by Ron and given a, a lot of practical assistance. Of course, I knew him as a colleague here. Uh, we served on dissertation committees together. We co-chaired a number of dissertations, and. Uh, the, what I could say of that experience is what everybody has been saying so far. Uh, what a generous personal, what a generous person he is, how warm and encouraging he is. Uh, and uh, I saw that firsthand as I know uh, almost all of you did as well. Uh, the last thing I would say, I guess, is that uh, last spring, in the spring semester of the fall, what they call the winter, the winter semester, I taught a course on political culture grad seminar on political culture and political identity. And in preparation for that, I went back and read or reread a very large number of Ron's works. Uh, and you can imagine that's quite a task because this is an enormous uh, body of work that, he, that he's published. And we uh, assigned, and I assigned to my students, uh, four or five articles and the better part of uh, his latest book. Uh, so it, uh, and so I, I shared with Ron what I was doing I asked him for suggestions about what it would be most important for him to, for the students to read. I uh, asked him if he would come to class virtually uh, and talk to the students, either at his pleasure or giving, a, uh, giving uh, a short lecture or simply being available to answer questions and have a dialogue uh, with students who had been reading a lot of his work. Uh, he accepted to come to the class and we were counting on him uh, shortly before his death. He 
emailed me and said he would be unable to come to class. He was very, uh, very sorry and apologetic. Uh, and he thanked me very sincerely for uh, attaching this importance to his work, for asking my students or asking our students to, um, to read as much of his work and, and to recognize how foundational and important it was. Uh, so, as I said, um, much of my interaction with Ron had con revolves around the idea of political culture or survey research uh, or comparative uh, comparison. Uh, but uh, it's the personal dimension that uh, that I, I respect, that I, I love the most. And as I said, I, I think of him almost every day. F. Engelhardt was the world famous founder of the World Village Survey in the year 1980. And then president of the World Village Survey for more than 30 years until 2013. Ronald Engelhardt served in the executive committee of the World Village Survey as founding president later on from 2013 until 2021 this year. He created and directed the World Health Survey, which developed and expanded thanks to his outstanding academic leadership over four decades, leading to the emergence of the biggest social science research program in the world. Ron Inglehart was the founding father and founding president of the World Health Survey, and he created at the same time also the biggest social science infrastructure in academic survey research with national teams of leading scholars of the WVS in more than 120 countries and societies in all continents across the globe. Ron Inglehart created and established a global network of scholars and researchers for more than 200 universities research institutes, think tanks, and survey institutes. The biggest research program in the social sciences worldwide had its institutional academic base and global center for many decades at the University of Michigan under the leadership of Ron Inglehart during his success story as a true giant of modern political and social sciences in this excellent American university. Ron is one of the most cited political scientists in the world, with more than 140,000 citations in other academic publications and with an uh, I-10 index of 369. This means that 369 of his own publications have been cited in 10 or more other academic books and journal articles. When I was promoted to the position of a full professor of politics at the University of Aberdeen, one precondition for full professors in British universities was a Hirsch age index of more than 20. The Hirsch index of Ron Inglehart of 118 represents the equivalent of the research and publication status of six full professors in politics in the UK. He was such a giant of um, political science research. Based at the University of Michigan, Ron developed an international academic collaboration with top uh, ranking universities like Harvard University, Princeton University in the USA, the University of Cambridge, the University of Southampton, King's College London in the United Kingdom, University of Sydney, University of Melbourne in Australia, Lefano University and Free University Berlin in Germany, University Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, University of Jordan, Qatar University, High School of Economics in Moscow, Catholic University Peru, uh, Beijing University in Shanghai, Chiantong University in mainland China, University of Bucharest, University of Warsaw, Institute for Future Studies in Sweden, 
and many dozens of other famous universities and institutes around the globe. Ron Inglehart was not only directing a huge global research program with more than 500,000 successful face-to-face -face interviews in 110 countries and societies worldwide. <clears throat> Above that, he published almost every year an academic book as a solo author or co-author, and his most recent book was published this year in 2021. His influential and famous, as well as best-selling books, have been translated into many world languages and have been used in hundreds of universities, in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and learning of thousands of students on all continents. The online analysis of the virtual survey, which was developed by Ron together with the Data Archive in Madrid, is used in many classes in social science methods across the whole world. My first personal meeting with Ron Inglehart uh, was in February 1995, which is 25 years ago. When I had the distinct honor to be the local host and organizer of the WS meeting, which prepared the then third wave of WS. The meeting took place in the famous Hotel Sache in Vienna, and Ron was chairing this successful meeting, which actually designed the whole way free of the World Rail Survey which was very successful. All meetings of the Executive Committee in the last four decades have been chaired by Ron. During his presidency with extreme politeness, diplomacy, kindness, efficiency, and a good sense of humor and understanding for all members of the so-called WS family. The World Reserve Association will deeply miss Ron our friend, our mentor, our colleague. He's, we will miss his friendship and brilliant scientific guidance. It is our greatest honor at the Revolution Survey Association and also outstanding duty to continue the global great mission of Ronald F. Inglehart to support and to develop his enormous academic legacy in a highly sustainable path in the glorious future of the World Rail Survey. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pippa Norris. I've known Ron for such a long time and count him amongst my closest friends, my most esteemed colleagues. What can I say to add to the memorial and the testament of so many other people who've known Ron and worked with him? So what's his life and legacy? I wanted to emphasize three things in particular. Firstly, many political scientists contribute to the discipline in a variety of different ways. What Ron had and what he brought above all was an enthusiasm for big ideas, a vision of how society had changed, started of course in the silent revolution in 1977, but then continued in all his lifetime work in which I was privileged and honored to share culture shifts in advanced industrialized societies, work on religion and secularization, changes in the family and in gender roles and in sexuality in rising tide, shifts in communications. And then lastly, of course, the changes which we're going through in terms of the rise of authoritarian populism. And we didn't always agree on all the different components, on the emphasis that should be made on all the different uh, parts of any theory. But above all, we shared a broad vision of how to explain cultural change and how to think through some of the big transformations going on in our societies today. Secondly, Ron Inglehart was not simply interested in theories, in philosophies and ideas for their own sake, but above all to collect new evidence, new data, new countries, ways to think through some of these issues and to, to look at cohort changes, to look at time series developments, to look at differences between different societies, between rich and poor, between Muslim and Christian, between those in Central Europe and those in Western Europe. 
and he had a tireless enthusiasm for collecting data with a wide network around the world of colleagues who admired his ideas and who wanted to contribute to this big, big project. And so he built a lasting legacy in the World Value Survey. And then <coughs> lastly, what else should we remember Ron by? Well, above all, his warmth and personal friendship. Always interested, always enthusiastic, always somebody who it was a pleasure to be around, who wanted to see people and meet new, new colleagues, whether they were graduate students starting off in their academic work, or people who had been well established, people who were from different countries around the world, as well as colleagues, of course, at Michigan and in the United States. So I think his ideas, his passion to collect survey evidence, and his personal warmth and, and, and ways in which he could interact with colleagues are things which we'll always remember, they'll always be part of his legacy, and they won't fade over time. We'll miss him terribly in so many different ways, but those are the things which will be his lifetime legacy and which we'll remember him by. Thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words and um, regards to all of his family, who I know have gone through very difficult times, and I hope that his legacy will live on. Thank you. A lot harder to just talk here than I thought it would be. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much, Nancy, for initiating this wonderful memorial event for Elizabeth and her family. Jane, Ronald, Milo, Adrian, all our family members who are on Zoom with us. Thank you for organizing it, Catherine and Barb and Anna. And thank you to every single person who talked this afternoon. And thank you to everybody who attends here in person or on Zoom and on us Ron's memory by being with us here this afternoon. During the planning, I always thought and sometimes say to Ronald and Milo, I hope it will be an event that would make Ron happy. And I truly believe it would have been, he would have been absolutely delighted if he had been here and you had <laughs> organized this event as long as he was alive. As his wife and mother of two of his five children, it would be easy to tell you story after story about Ron as a private person. But today I would like to share with you some thoughts about Ron the scientist, the man behind his work. Why? Because I hope that especially graduate students and junior faculty members who might receive support for their own work from the Ronald Inglehart Scholarship Fund will find it interesting to, help, uh, to hear about this personal side of the scientist. Three main characteristics made Ron's work possible. First, his intellect. Ron was intellectually brilliant, no doubt about it. His thinking was characterized by an amazing intellectual curiosity. He was reading constantly social science and non-social science, non-fiction. And on Easter this year, I gave him a book from a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he read half of it the same night and talked to me about it in detail at breakfast the next morning. He had an open mind, was quick in making connections between different types of information that nobody else might see connections. 
and was the least judgmental person I know. Part of the pleasure to share life with him was that it was always interesting. The second essential characteristic for his work was his lifelong passion for finding meaning in politics and life and making the world a better and safer place for everybody and his unwavering persistence in doing so. When I read the diaries he wrote when he was eight years old, I was amazed that this little boy discussed the filibuster that was going on. <laughs> and the last sentence in his last book that was published this year about religion was, and the search for meaning continues. And this sentence could not have been more appropriate for the last sentence of the last book on road. To the last day of his life, he talked with great passion about finishing a book he was working on with Chinese colleagues with the interesting title, China as number one. We were in the urgent care unit in the emergency room for three days and nights waiting for him to get in the ICU because of COVID, there was no place. And during this time, he talked about this book in so much detail and he talked about how it can be finished and what it will mean. And I'm sorry, he never could finish it. This lifelong persistence and determination was also a given in our personal life. And you had to be a strong personality to not cave in. And the kids know that very well. Third and above all other characteristics is one's courage, physically and intellectually. Everybody in academics has intellectual qualities. You all here have them. Everybody has persistence. You all would not be here if you were not brilliant and persistent. But what made one special was his courage. Thinking and then writing in the 1970s that the left-right dimension is no longer explaining the world and that a new dimension of materialism, post-materialism, explains what is happening is amazing and gutsy and was definitely courageous. Standing up to constant verbal and written attacks on his theory did not deter him for a minute. Instead, he always told me every criticism can help me express better what is really going on. Equally Gutsy was the title of an oral presentation he gave in Paris at an international association of political science meeting. And the title was The Withering Away of Marxism. And it was the first and only time I saw a group of attendees at a conference presentation, all from Russia, get up and leave the presentation with loud protest. This courage was combined with an unwavering self-confidence that made him not ever doubt himself and his theory. So to benefit from one, the person behind the science, be curious and have an open mind. Be passionate about the questions you pursue and be persistent. And be brave and courageous and contribute to finding meaning in this complex world and politics and make the world a better place and one will look down on you and cheer you on for the progress you make. Okay, so that ends our formal um, uh, event. And I wanna thank all the presenters, including those presented uh, by video and online, all the people who are online, uh, the audience here. Uh, um, we will have a reception, we'll begin shortly right outside. So thank you very much uh, for attending. And uh, we'll, we'll all remember Ron with these many good words. Um, thank you.